want to tell a story about an experience around the World Championships in St. Moritz in 2003. And um, before that, I need to ask that you don't fact check any of the stuff because <laughs> ski stories are like fishing stories and there's a certain amount of artistic license involved and the further away they are, the more that grows. And I think I've earned this, so please just take my word for it. It wa was what it was. And And before that, I have to jump a little bit to the beginning, and you'll see it's going to be scattered a bit. But growing up with uh, very interesting parents, uh, my, my dad's father, my grandfather, was a surgeon on the East Coast, and my dad's two older brothers were doctors. And my dad was in third-year medical school um, when he dropped out to pursue his passion of being a hippie. And he spoke at Woodstock, and he moved into the woods in New Hampshire and married my mom. And raised us completely off the grid. So I kind of, whether it was me thinking it or it was put on me by everyone else, I thought of myself as pretty open-minded and um, without many sort of barriers imposed on me. And um, that really helped me throughout my career. When I was seven, I decided I was going to be an Olympian and I and, uh, wouldn't let anyone tell me anything different. And that was sort of outside the box for what most people at that time would have said I should have been thinking about as a seven-year-old. But um, Fast forward to the Olympics in, in 2002, which was my second Olympics, and I, I had a pretty remarkable series of races. I made a, a huge comeback in the giant slalom, and uh, after a bunch of mistakes and stuff that I dug myself into a nice hole, um, to get a silver medal. And, and it, it really kind of, I think, pulled at people's heartstrings because it was a very American, you know, hippie, me version of, of the Olympics. It was this come from behind, rocky story against the, the Austrians who were an incredible powerhouse at that time. And then, and then on the, another race was the combined and I had all these mistakes and that was where I went on my hip and blew out of the slalom three times and then made this miraculous um, second run of a slalom and gained on the Norwegians who are the disciplined focus, super nice, but, but really the, the legendary skiers on the World Cup. So it kind of it put this seed in people's minds, um, at least in hindsight, now I can recognize that at the time, I don't think I did, um, that, that there was this level of inspiration that, that I liked to bring or that I was capable of bringing um, that maybe they didn't find with all the other racers. In 2003, um, I'd had a good season and I was, I'd won a, a few races, but um, I came into that, and, and I think, as some of you may know, that the Swiss will root for the Swiss guys and me, but nobody else. And the Austrians will root for the Austrian guys and me, but nobody else. And the French guys will root for the French guys and, the, uh, and me and nobody else. And as you can imagine, it kind of goes all the way through all the nations. So I, I had, by you know, default, a much bigger fan base present than, than any of the other racers, which was, which was fortunate for me. Um, but the combined race, was one of these times where something remarkable outside of the result happened. And uh, some of you have followed my career. You know, I always talked about the result being secondary to the experience and, and what you sort of received or what you gave or what you shared throughout that experience. And um, the, the day of the combined was terrible. It should have been canceled. It was like 40 mile an hour winds and really, really cold. And, and uh, they ran it anyway. And I came down. I'd been, I think I, one of the runs I was second in the, in the training run. Um, so I thought I was going to be right in there, and here I am tucking along and, you know, skiing well, and I get to the bottom, and I'm, I was three seconds behind the guy in the lead, and the guy in the lead was terrible at that time. So I was completely out of the race right as it started. I had frostbite all over my face, and, and uh, I was really a, a pretty miserable start, and the crowd, you could kind of hear them, like, all just like, it was like, ooh, when I came across the line. And even though they'd seen the split times all the way down, I think they were still imagining that that seed that I'd planted the year before of like, he's gonna just somehow pull off some three second miracle in the last 10 seconds and I didn't. And, and so it was, it was pretty, pretty tough. And you know, I remember sort of the, the cheering and like the going out through the corrals and everybody kind of being like, you, you know, stay with it. And like, like Bob said, you got this. Like, you know, I was never, I was one of those people who people thought I was never really out of it. So even though in my own mind at that time, I was pretty much out of it. So I ran the second, the first run of the slalom and skied all right and made up a bunch of time, but was still nowhere near the podium. And I had a bunch of really strong slalom skiers in front of me. And, and I hadn't really necessarily engaged with the crowd at that point much, but 
Um, but I could feel the energy building. The, the weather cleared up. It actually got a lot warmer. Um, and, and it got a little bit sunny in between runs. And at the start of the second run, you could hear they were chanting this. They would do this bodhi, bodhi, mill. Like it was weird. But you could hear it all the way at the, at the top of the slalom. And I remember being like, all right, well, against everything else, right? I'm, I'm not going to win. I'm not probably going to medal just because I was still way, way behind Amat and Schuess, who were, you know, between them have I don't know how many um, Olympic and World Championship medals. But, and there was also a bunch of really good slalom skiers who were still way ahead of me. So that was really the problem. And I, I remember sort of being like, all right, let's put on, like, let's, let's really give them a show. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go like absolute red line. And like, not like I didn't do that anyway, but I was really like, I kind of remember a moment where I was like, like, really, I'm going to see if there's like a chance that I might not even make it to the third gate, like, because I'm going to be going so like aggressive. And, and I went for it. I remember kind of like, not that I like blacked out, but honestly, that it was like, I remember feeling like almost like I wasn't really the one doing it. Like I was kind of just, I was there and I was watching and my body was doing its thing and I was, and people would say like, that's the zone or the flow. This was different than those things. I've done those things. This was not that. This was like, this was like you being up there behind yourself watching somebody like on a video game remote controlling you and be like, oh my God, I'm killing it. And I was like, oh my God, you're killing it. Like it wasn't even me. And, and I got to the finish line and the crowd went crazy because I had a huge margin on the guys who were down and, and they kind of like they had that moment. And I think that was, I, I, at that point, I really still had no even thoughts of, of meddling or anything because it was, it was just the, the gaps were still too big. But the crowd, being who they are, was kind of like they were empowered and they felt like they were actually a part of it, I think. And, and I was standing there in the finish line because you have to when you're, when you're in the lead. And as the next few guys came down, and as I said, I, I don't know what position I was in, but there was still like 10 or 12 guys to come um, who were all faster than me in the first two. And, uh, and as each guy came down, I started feeling these like, almost like waves, like coming from behind me. And I, of course, at that point, I was kind of like, oh yeah, sure, I hope he's slower than me. That's just a natural racer thing. Like when he's coming down, I hope he comes down like 500s behind me. And the guy would come down and be behind you. And you're like, yay. And then, um, <laughs> but, but this was like, all of a sudden, something kind of merged together where what I was putting out there, my emotions, which at that time, I didn't think were really that strong. Like I said, I wasn't really that enthusiastic about my chances, but they merged with everyone else's, and it wasn't just the people in the stands. It was like an enormous number of people all across Europe, all across the U.S. who were watching that particular race. And when that merger happened, it was like, it was like empowering, but, but also really raw. There was a raw element to it. And it was, I, I became sort of entranced, and I remember the coaches were kind of watching me, and they're like, hey, you're on camera. And I was like, just like in this weird zone, and they were like, like, smile or do something and stop looking weird. Like, and, and I just sat there and was like in this completely unique space that I'd never been in before. And, and as the last guys came down, and, and it kept happening, guys were just stacking in there from having three seconds, 3.4 seconds on me after the downhill, losing some in the first round of the slalom, and then coming in, you know, 23 hundredths behind. And then it got down to, to three guys or two guys left, and they were Amat and Schuess. And they had, I think they still had 2.4 seconds on me, and it's one run of slalom, and they're both accomplished slalom skiers. So they came down. I remember this, like, it was like intensifying. It was like, again, like waves crashing, but really subtle. And I was just so in awe of the whole experience, and I didn't want to like mess it up. I didn't want to like talk to somebody or like, and so I just sat there and watched, and I could tell as they were coming down that they simply were being manipulated. Like this, this human energy, this element, this element of passion or, or whatever, whatever you want to call it, the home field advantage, which I was experiencing, was literally affecting chronological time. And it wasn't like it was affecting them. They were still going normal speed. It was just like the clock didn't actually matter. It was like, you're going to be just behind them, sorry, because that's what we all want, and that's the way it's going to be. And, and it was, and I tell you what, so I, Lasse came down and was 700. So this is three minutes and 20 seconds of, of racing. And like I said, in 40 mile an hour wins and three seconds plus behind and two runs of slalom with all kinds of mistakes. And he came down 700 behind me. And then, and then Amat came down, the last guy, and was 1300 behind me. So three of us after three minutes and 20 seconds, all within, you know, just over a tenth of a second. And 
I, I broke down right after it happened because they, they pulled me off the thing, like, you got to go congratulate him, and it, like, broke me out of my trance or whatever it was I was in, and I just, like, started crying. No one could, I mean, especially them, they are Norwegian, and they were like, dude, dude, <laughs> you don't cry. You know, this is, not, this is not how it works. Clearly, you need to, like, figure it out. But, but it wasn't anything to do with the result. They, they, I think, thought I was crying because of the result. It wasn't that at all. It was just that complete like dissolution of two different things. A, the connectivity of the fans, which I'd never directly felt, tangibly felt, and then secondarily, this like dissolving of these barriers that I'd put around what I believed the human emotion or our force of will could affect, which was chronological time. I just didn't, I thought that I didn't have those, but mine were just slightly bigger than what everyone else were, were what barriers you'd put around what you can and can't affect. And, to have it affect that so dramatically right in front of me where I could feel, and again, it's not scientifically proven, but for me it was impactful in that I just, I felt those walls kind of dissolve and I was like, wow, I, I just, I felt so much more free. Plus I felt much more connected to the, the fans and people, which um, was singularly the most impactful shift in my entire life because before that I'd had, you know, moments of impatience or petulance and dealing with thousands of Europeans all day, every day, um, gets really tiring after a while. But that one moment was like, a, it was a shift where I started to be like, all right, we're all, we're all sort of one here. Like, and I really, I did, I did, uh, I moved a lot forward. And what, what the sort of the end result of all that was that it drove me to, to linking up with more um, people who had researched or understood um, that phenomenon that I'd had and like, and what that meant. What, what the observational effect of humans and, and the emotional impact and the, the willpower or force can do to the physical world around you. And, and um, ironically, we're at TEDx, and um, the, the most incredible platform has been the TED Talks and TEDx for that stuff. And um, I just want to point you guys to a couple of these experiments, and I would encourage you to do them at home. This one's really easy. It just takes a box of Uncle Ben's and a couple jars. But... It's, it's incredible, and, and I'm doing it with my kids um, now, and the point of it is to show them and empower them. And the things we've seen tonight, I mean, the, the breadth and scope of, of the topics um, from whales and salmon to, you know, speaking your truth to, um, you know, crones and, and sitting on the potty and, and Pearl Jam um, <laughs> to global warming and, and the plains. There's just... There's a connectivity level here that I think we all are seeing that's much bigger than, than one thing. It's not just a connection between you and your family or you and your friends or, or us as a country. It's, it's us as a, as a species with all the other species on the planet, with our planet, with you know, even greater than that. So um, these experiments, I, I would encourage you all to go on to YouTube or TEDx platform. Just check them out. And if there's other people you can do them with, especially young people, I think just allowing somebody to understand that their emotions and their feelings have a tangible effect on the world around them and the responsibility that that comes with. I have a four-year-old who, who understood it just from this. And he was like, well, he would never thought of it before. And I think that's something, an action step that we can all take that, that really has the ability to move all these topics we talked about tonight forward simultaneously. And, and they're all sort of pulling in the same direction. This one is, is an easy one, you just go on. I just wanted to put this up here so you could see it to point you in the right direction. Um, Masuro Omoto is an incredible um, person as well. He has a whole bunch of experiments on water and essentially we're mostly made of water, the planet's mostly made of water. Um, I think there's a lot of application to that and it's, it really will, I hope, open your mind to, to some of the possibilities. The rice experiment gets poked out all the time even though everyone who tries it and does it actually uh, it works every single time, but they still get mad about that. But then there's a lot of scientific stuff that I think is relevant. Roger Nelson and a, another team from Princeton, they do these experiments where they create random event generators, which are a machine, whether it's decaying, um, bioactive material or whatever, it, it's completely random, um, truly random. And then they have people think about stuff remotely. It can be here or in New York or wherever, not close to the event at all and just try to make it go up or down. And they have consistent results over eight years um, that people are able to do that, just with no, no real emotional connection to it. And I believe um, that's really what gives it some intensity, but they're able to actually affect this 
completely random uh, event generator result uh, over and over and over again. So as you go into this, for those of you who are skeptical about all this type of thing, there's a lot of really valuable things that just will give you enough to, to buy into it, to, to own your own role in that, because essentially we all have that role. And you know, when you hear this call to action, I think um, you know, that's the ethos. That's the, that's, the, that's the part that actually, it's the overarching theme is connectivity. And it's, you have it in yourself to do it, but you also have the ability to tap into everyone else because it doesn't take a conversation. You just have to look around and see that this is for everyone. And the more we understand and embrace that connectivity between all of us and all of everything, um, the better we'll be as humans. So thank you.